from the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. I am Estefania Bravo. This is From the South. Today marks the first anniversary of the murder of Rio de Janeiro Councilwoman Mariel Franco. Citizens in Rio paid tribute to her on the same street where she and her driver, Anderson Gomez, were gunned down. With flowers, banners and chanting, demonstrators asked the question, who killed Mariel? She is remembered for being a fiercest defender of human rights, as well as of the rights of Afro-Brazilians and the LGBTI community. <laughs> Family and friends of Mariel Franco also held a mass in her memory. The anniversary of her death comes two days after Brazilian police arrested two former military police officers in connection with her murder. Mariel was a woman who symbolized and still symbolizes someone with great strength who wanted to change her country. We have no doubt that the arrests are an important step. Too bad it took a year for this. There were many mistakes along the way, but this step only has value if it helps us find out who ordered the murder, which political group is capable of killing, who is capable of letting violence be a way of doing politics in Rio de Janeiro in the 21st century. We won't stop our fight until we know who ordered the murder of Mariel, not just who pulled the trigger. 400 women from the landless workers' movement in Brazil occupied train tracks used by mining company Vale. But police finally broke up the protests using tear gas and rubber bullets in order to make sure the Vale trains would not be delayed. At least 10 demonstrators were injured, most of them older women. In January, a dam owned by the Vale mining company burst, killing at least 200 people. Our correspondent Ignacio Lemus has, uh, was earlier at the protest in Sarcedo. We are here at the train tracks that the Vale company uses to move its goods to other countries. Women belongings to the MST are condemning Vale and its practices. Almost 400 women have joined together to say Vale continues to commit environmental crimes with impunity. In January, in the municipality of Rumandino, a dam belonging to Vale broke, killing 200 people. Right now, we are nearby Rumandino, and it's another dangerous area with dams. These protests are also taking place on March 14 in remembrance of the one-year anniversary of the murder of Councilwoman Mariel Franco, and come as part of a number of demonstrations that MST women have held starting on International Women's Day. We thank Nacho for that report. Hundreds of women, members of the Landless Workers Movement in Brazil, have occupied one of the farms owned by a religious leader accused of harassing hundreds of women. We have more in this report. Over 800 women from the Landless Workers Movement in Brazil occupied one of the farms owned by the medium, Joao de Duas, who has been accused of sexual abuse and violence against around 500 women and jailed since December 2018. We are in one of the many areas of land owned by Joao de Deus. He is accused of exerting violence against many women during his sessions, so we have come here to denounce his abuse and we want his lands to be given over to the agrarian reform. We also want victims to be recognized and compensated. This year, we are also mobilizing on a national level against the reform promoted by the president. All Capistan women and all working women are standing up against this reform. That clearly goes against us. It's also a special date because of the anniversary of the mother of our comrade, Mariere Franco. From the farm, Don Inacio, in Annapolis, in the state of Goiás, they remember the human attack. Mary El Franco and urged the clarification of the murder last March 14, 2018, and who promoted that political crime. They also criticized the machista view and the backtracking by the current government, the increase in femicides and attacks against agrarian reform. We are going through a really tricky political moment. We have two governments, one that does not accept this kind of protest, and we have a president that also rejects the landless workers' movement. This is a great challenge for us, entering this farm as a conquest. We don't know where all this money comes from, all this abuse against women, and all of the oppression that women continue to suffer. 
Our occupation, our protest, is a sign that we are fighting for our rights. We demand that the women are respected. Another struggle is agrarian reform. We know how important her own land is for a woman and her family. In Brazil, the country with the fifth highest number of women being violently killed, they are protesting against misery and inequality. They are calling for the end of the patriarchy. Let's go back to Brazil and to talk more about Marielle Franco's murder, we are joined live by Talita Tanishai. She's a feminist activist in Rio de Janeiro. Thank you, Talita, for your time for Telesur. Do you think we are now seeing a real advance in the investigation into Marielle Franco's murder? Yes, I do believe in that. Also because we have like a international promotion and also the social movements in Brazil in the last year were like very active to to have to like to change this situation and to find the truth about he, her mother. Thanks. With the Bolsonaro family, and do we have any idea who ordered her to be killed and why? We do not have the the name of the person that was responsible for her murder, but we do know that it's related with the militias and that the Bolsonaro's family are really involved with this sort of group here in Rio de Janeiro. Talita, lastly, why do you think uh, Mariel was seen as a threat? Because she was a woman, she was a black woman, she was bisexual, and especially because she belonged to a left-wing political party that is always fighting for the right of minorities, for the right of poor people in Brazil. What activities are happening in Rio de Janeiro to honor Mariel Franco? Since yesterday we are having like a lot of talks and conferences at universities and like also now we are having a massive street protest because the thing that three days ago we found the people who killed her and now we want to know who is behind these people that killed her. Who is this uh, a specific person or group that ordered her murder? Talita, how has this personally affected you as a, as a feminist? How has her killing affected you? It's difficult to say very much uh, in the last year, in the 14th of March, I was in Santiago de Chile. And when I saw the news and everything, I couldn't believe. It's like nowadays I say that I couldn't believe that in 2018, Marielle was murdered, Lula was sent to the jail, and Bolsonaro was elected president. These three parties are very hard to believe that are like that have passed in Brazil. Talita, we thank you so much for your time for Telesur English. Thank you very much. We have been speaking with Talita Stanshai. She's a feminist in Rio de Janeiro. Let's go to more news now. The police in Colombia have used force to disperse indigenous protesters who blocked the Pan American Highway in Cauca State. The indigenous communities gathered in the Pidal Ancestral Territory after talks with the authorities broke down. They say the government of President Ivan Duque has shown a lack of political to discuss their demands and reach agreements. And they condemned the action of the Ismad Right Police against their protests, which left many injured. The community says it will continue to resist until the governor of Cauca agrees to meet them. And moving on, the Venezuelan foreign minister says all U.S. diplomats have now left the country. Jorge Arreaza tweeted that the United States Embassy had withdrawn all its diplomatic, consular, and administrative staff within the 72-hour period laid down by President Nicolás Maduro. 
and the delegation from the American Council for Peace is in Venezuela. They gave a news conference to express their unrestricted support for the Venezuelan people and the Bolivarian Revolution. Gabriel Aguirre, Secretary of the Committee of International Solidarity and the Fight for Peace, said that the delegation arrived in the country to counter the U.S. attack on Venezuela. They wanted to see firsthand the effects of sanctions on the country. The government of Venezuela has confirmed that electricity has been fully restored across the country this Thursday. Our correspondent, Luis Tavera, is in Caracas and has more. We are on the streets of Caracas. As normality returns to the capital after electricity was completely restored across the nation, Venezuelans recognized that this latest attack was an attempt to destabilize peace in the country. Nonetheless, citizens tried to go on with their daily lives despite the lack of power. But it was on Thursday when finally power was fully restored and the Caracas metro started to operate again. Citizens have also continued to work to make sure food is available for everyone through many social programs. The government has also promised to provide further updates about the country's power grid and the advancements made to fix it. That was Luis Tavera from, Carac uh, from Caracas, yes. Venezuela has condemned the decision by Ecuador to pull out of the South American regional bloc UNASUR. On Wednesday night, the Ecuadorian president Lenin Moreno went on TV to claim that the body had ceased to have a function and blame what he called the vices of the 20th century socialism. He also said his government would remove the, st the statue of the former Argentinian president Nestor Kirchner located in the building in Quito, who was the first secretary general of UNASUR. And in response, Venezuela's Foreign Minister Jorge Raza tweeted a quote from Latin America's independence leader, Simón Bolívar. It said, we cannot have traitors in our ranks, otherwise we will lose our great homeland. Simón Bolívar led the first unification of Latin American nations in the 19th century. A judge in Argentina revealed de details of an extraordinary web of extortion and espionage surrounding the so-called notebooks case. That's the investigation into alleged corruption by the former president, Cristina Fernandez, and her family, which they have denied. Our correspondent in Buenos Aires, Sabrina Roth, has more. After the federal judge, Ramos Padilla, appeared on Wednesday before the Freedom Expression Committee of Congress of the leaders of the governing coalition, Elisa Carrio tweeted a picture of herself in stripped pajamas, and she said that the opposition and the judge want to see her in jail. This tweet provoked angry reactions in social media because this is a case with very serious implications, unlike anything seen since the return of democracy. At the committee hearing, the judge showed overwhelming evidence of a network of illegal operations linked to judges, ministers, and other politicians, as well as the security forces and the media. The official party of Macri didn't attend the hearing. They accused Kishner supporters of an operation to remove the attorney general, Carlos Estranelli, from the notebook case. But it is not true that this would end the case, because there are two attorneys on the notebook case, so it would continue without him. The argument for removing Estranelli is that a lot of evidence has emerged linking him to another lawyer in the case, Marcelo D'Alessio, who is under arrest for allegedly blackmailing a number of witnesses. D'Alessio is also accused of working for the United States Drug Enforcement Administration. We'll take a short break now. Join us again in a minute. Welcome back. Human rights organizations in Guatemala are worried about recent cases of lynching of alleged criminals. They say it shows the state is not providing security and justice to the population. The human rights organization Mutual Support has published a report on lynchings in Guatemala with alarming figures. In the last 10 years, the country has seen 1,656 incidents in which 360 people were killed and there have been more lynchings in 2019. In 2019, just in January, there were already four lynchings and eight more in February. But the report was prepared in January and it only deals with those four lynchings. Two happened in Esquintla, one in Quetzaltenango, and another in Weiweitenango. 
The report states that people chose to lynch criminals because they're fed up that the police are not doing their job at arresting those who commit crimes. Other cases are linked to extortion and sexual abuse. The failure of the state to guarantee justice has led to the increase in lynchings, the report states. We are really worried because this shows Guatemala is a violent country where problems are not resolved by the institutions. There is a complete lack of trust in public institutions, especially the police and the justice system. Researchers say that for many years people believed that lynchings only happened in indigenous communities of the interior of the country. However, last year, the central region, including the capital, saw many lynchings. In this region, crime figures remain the same compared with other regions where lynchings have reduced the level of crime. We can see that in most of the country where homicides take place, there are no lynchings. But where there are lynchings, there are no homicides either. Only two districts have both kinds of violence. The Department of Guatemala has a high murder rate of 54 for every 100,000 inhabitants. And it was also reported that in 2018, there were 15 lynchings. The demand from human rights activists is for the state to assume its role in guaranteeing justice and security. Because if it doesn't, lynchings will continue, with furious citizens supposedly taking justice into their own hands, but in fact committing brutal crimes themselves. Trinidad and Tobago's Prime Minister can breathe a sigh of relief after medical tests provided that he has no need for heart surgery. Keith Rowley posted a photo of himself and his doctor in the U.S. as he shared the news on social media. The PM left for the U.S. last week for coronary testing. He'll remain under observation for a few more days before returning home. In 2016, while undergoing prostate cancer screening, Rowley also underwent coronary testing that revealed soft plaque in one of his arteries. indicating that today I would respond. Also in Trinidad and Tobago, biodegradable degradable and eco-friendly packaging for the food and beverage industry will be exempt from custom duties for the next two years. The move coincides with the decision to ban the importation and use of styrofoam packaging this year. The government says the ban would be implemented once the required customs codes are finalized. Jamaica's government is placing greater focus on gender issues and has allocated close to $70 million to purchase property for women's shelters. You would have heard um, of resources allocated for two additional centers to assist women who find themselves in situations of conflict or situation um, in which they are being abused. We had allocated resources to build one last year, and now we've allocated resources for an additional two. Grenada's government has launched an investigation into a company that benefited from the island's citizenship by investment program. The company called Grenada Sustainable Aquaculture failed to deliver on a state-of-the-art shrimp farm. Prime Minister Keith Mitchell says the government is seeking regional and international support to deal with the proprietors as they collected significant sums of money. On October 6, 9, the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration decided to ground all Boeing 737 MAX 8 jets until further notice, and it has caused distress at some Caribbean airports. At least one American Airlines model at Trinidad's Piarco International Airport is unable to leave the country, and in Barbados, dozens of American Airlines passengers were also left in shambles after MAX 8 flights were canceled. The European Union has added five more Caribbean countries to its tax haven blacklist, and CARICOM isn't happy about it. Barbados, Bermuda, Aruba, Belize, and Dominica failed to make specific commitments to adapt their tax rules and practices according to EU standards. However, CARICOM Secretary General Erwin Larocque says many of the countries are compliant according to relevant regulatory authorities. CARICOM leaders say the EU's blacklisting has brought considerable damage to the community. The deliberations of this council today. Bolivia's central bank says it will maintain its own policies, which have been, so far, a major success for the country's economy. Let's find out more. The central bank of Bolivia implemented the counter-cyclical policy. 
What it means is that the government manages the economy so that the prices of raw materials don't drop and spending is reduced. In times of global economic contraction, we have expanded credit and a policy for reducing interest rates. Adapting measures that go against the norm of economics has proven to be successful for the Bolivian economy. The exchange rate has remained stable, which without doubt favors expansionary policies by generating lower inflation. All of this is contrary to what has been happening to other economies. Because of its counter-cyclical policy, Bolivia is expected to lead in economic performance in the region this year, like it has done for the last five years. We will continue fighting against the adverse effects of economy cycles to avoid undermining our economy. We want to avoid employment and depriving families. A stable exchange rate will persist. We at the central bank are confident about this. In 2019, experts estimate that the country's GDP will grow by over 4.5% because of a nearly $8 billion state investment. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. Welcome back. The U.S. Senate has passed a proposal to end the national emergency declared by President Donald Trump. Twelve Republican senators broke rank and sided with Democrats to try and put an end to Trump's so-called national emergency. In response, President Trump took to social media to simply tweet the words veto, followed by an exclamation mark. Trump declared a national emergency last month in order to bypass Congress and fund his long-promised border wall. If not, the yeas are 59. British members of Parliament have voted to delay Brexit, giving embattled Prime Minister Theresa May more time to break the deal lock. MPs voted 412 to 202 for a motion, which instructs the Prime Minister to ask the European Union for an extension to with the withdrawal process. Following the vote, May is expected to head to Brussels to ask that the European Union keep the UK in the bloc until June 30th. The eyes to the right, 412. The nose to the left, 202. Authorities in Nigeria have called off the search for survivors after a building collapsed in Lagos Island. The building housed a primary school and a nursery. It came down on Wednesday morning, killing at least 10 people. At least 37 people were rescued alive. It's believed more than 100 students were in the three-story building when it came down. The governor of Lagos says the school was operating illegally. He blamed the, la the landlord for resisting the government's demolition plan. The National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa, NUMSA, will picket outside the U.S. consulate in Johannesburg in protest against interference in Venezuela. In a media statement, the union said the picket is part of global actions to defend the sovereignty of Venezuela and the Bolivarian Revolution. NUMSA members will be joined by members of the Socialist Revolutionary Workers' Party. They have called on other progressive organizations to take part in defending Venezuela's sovereignty. The World Health Organization has announced it has contained the Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It said the number of new cases and the epicenter has dropped by over 50 percent. The organization, however, said the deteriorating security situation in the region poses a threat to the progress made in containing the epidemic. The current Ebola outbreak, first declared last August, is believed to have killed more than 550 people so far and affected over 300 more. Now let's take a look at some other stories from around the world. The head of the state-backed Saudi Human Rights Commission has dismissed an international investigation into the killing of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. The commission described the investigation as interference, adding that everyone accused was already facing justice in the country. Khashoggi, a Washington Post columnist, was killed in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul in October, provoking an international outcry. 
Polish bishops have presented a report on the number of cases of child abuse in the clergy between 1990 and 2018, in which nearly 400 clergymen were found to have committed sexual abuse of minors. The report presented to Pope Francis coincided with the gathering of the world's top Catholic bishops at the Vatican summit on tackling clerical sex abuse. Protests have rocked India's southern state of Tamil Nadu after videos showing sexual assault on female college students were posted online. Outrage increased after police said this was part of a wider plot by a group of men who befriended female students for sexual acts, then filmed them and used the video footage to blackmail them. Student protesters and women's rights campaigners demand police swift investigation of the cases and provide protection to the victims. We have come here on behalf of National Women's Front to show support to the affected women who have been facing sexual harassment for the past few years in Polach. The alleged crime boss of the New York Mafia's Gambino family, Francesco Cali, has been killed in front of his estate and island home. Police sources confirmed he was shot multiple times by unidentified gunmen. Gambino crime operation is one of the five historic Italian-American mafia families in New York and believed to make money through violence and extortion and illegal drug distribution. And with that, we've come to the end of this news brief. These and other stories, as always, find them on our website at telesetenglish.net. And also join us on social media. We're on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. For Telesetenglish, I am Stefania Bravo. Thank you for watching.